Christina Skarbek, Christine Granville, was one of the most highly decorated female agents of the Second World War, and she was by far one of the most daring. Her story is quite simply incredible. Now, I am so excited because if I tried to explain her story to you, I can tell you it would be a feeble attempt. But luckily, I'm with the person who has brought her story back to life and more than anyone else has publicized it and taken it out to the world. We are with author and I guess historian as well. Are you more historian than author or author or historian? More historian. No, more author. Who knows? <laughs> well, you will be the judge of that at the end of this conversation. Claire Mully. Hello, Claire. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, I have had you on my radar for some time in a strictly professional sense of Good. being wanting to speak to you with, on the basis of this remarkable book that you've written. I think, it, how, how, many, how many years did it come out? now it's, it's been a little while. It's been while. out for a little while. Yeah. It's been out a little, little while. Maybe we won't mention it just to not make us feel old. But having read it, I remember at the time thinking, wow, it's amazing I didn't know this story anyway. You know, it was amazing that this book was the first book to tell me. Can you tell me, before we get into the chronology of this incredible woman, but this also very quixotic woman, when did you first find out about the woman who would become Christine Granville? Um, well, so I first got interested in Polish history when I was doing my first degree, um, very fascinated by the geopolitics, which gives this such a rich history. And then I taught English as a foreign language in Bydgoszcz for a while as a volunteer and became more interested. Um, but then my first book was on a British woman. And uh, when it came out, I actually won a prize and I nearly fell off my chair. I found something <laughs> that I could do. I'm good at this. So I needed a new subject and I was thinking about the Polish stories. Um, but I'm also a feminist and I felt that a lot of the women's stories haven't really been told very well. You mm. know, often we focus on the women, we talk about their beauty and their courage, which of course they were very courageous, um, and their sacrifice seems to be mentioned a lot. And again, it's very important to remember the high price that some of these people paid. But we're not very good at talking about women's achievements. And Christina Scarbeck, Christine Granville, is someone who enables you to talk very much about the achievements of the women in the front line. And her story is so incredible that if you wrote it down as a fictional film, I think people say this is ridiculous. But we're going to have to somehow, in the short time that we have, roll through it a little bit like a train, uh, a metaphor that was used about her and her many lovers. Uh, uh, such a fascinating character. So uh, I think we're going to try and attempt the impossible and do a brief sketch of her mm. chronological life, starting okay. with uh, the fact that she was born into a half Polish, half Jewish Polish uh, family, and quite an interesting one at that. Can we begin with that story? Yes. So. Uh, Christina was a Polish-born countess. Her husband had married her Jewish-born mother who had converted to Roman Catholicism before the marriage. And she was brought up, I think when she was very little, she adored her father. He was this great figure. He absolutely adored her, taught her to ride. She could hunt. Um, she had a lot of freedom on the family estate. But because her mother had been born Jewish, she was never really fully accepted in the higher echelons of society. Um, as across you know, all Europe, not just Poland, there was unfortunately considerable anti-Semitism. So in a lot of ways, she grew up having to fight her corner. And she gained a lot of skills in terms of her character, like resilience as well. Um, that became very useful for her later career in the war. And also horse riding, I think. And, uh, horse riding. She made yeah. outrageous claims about shooting and, and all sorts of stuff on the estate, I think, when she was older. But it, it, yeah, uh, she did. She, she, um, I think one of the things I found when I came out to Poland to do some research is um, it, I went to her the parish where she was brought up and baptised, um, rather late, actually. And there was um, a beautiful photograph of uh, a gentleman on a horse. And I wanted to use it and say, this yes. is her father, you know, could be in front of her house, Tretnika. And, um, but we didn't know who the rider was, so we didn't use it. But on the back, it said Satan, which was the name of her father's favorite horse, which had thrown the last rider and broken his legs. And there's a wonderful story of him having all of his political friends for dinner and taking them to the stables to show off his horses. And the last horse isn't there. So the groom really gets it, you know, he's shouting at the groom. And then Christina, aged 14 or something, comes riding this horse bareback over the hill and she's broken it in just to show off to her father. So but that's that's the spirit of the woman. There's an, another incredible story later on in the book where she's, I think she's in the bushes being sniffed at by a, a, dog, a, a, the, a Gestapo. German, German guard, uh, a border guard dog. Border guard dog. So basically a dog trained to kill, essentially. Trained to, trained to bring people down, to break bones. And, yeah. and the, the, I think she's there with Andre at the time, her, I, I she's believe. Uh, no, she's wrong. in France, so she's not with Andre at Sorry. that point. Sorry, uh, because there's a lot of characters to get through here, and unfortunately with Claire, but she somehow manages to sort of, she says some Polish words to the dog and, and gives yes, him something to lick yes. or something, I mean, basically I think tames this might be her dog. favourite word. So yes, I mean, she's, she's been walking in the mountains dressed as a peasant woman, and this is in the Alps and the borders between um, France and Spain. And one of her big achievements was that she made the first contact between the French resistance and the 
Polish and and the Italian partisans on the other side of the Alps. So she's yeah. up in the mountains and her shoes have been rubbing. So she's used a bit of chicken fat on her heels just to sort of ease it a bit. And this dog comes up to find her and she just rubs this fat on her hand and gives it to the dog and calls him, you know, her Kahani. And very quickly, just incredible yeah, presence that dog of mind. was defected as well and never went back to the Germans. Never so, went back to the yeah. so here we have already in those two separate instances, and obviously I've jumped too far forward, but this woman with some kind of quixotically amazing power to seduce both man and beast, quite literally. Well, a lot of people, I mean, I also, when I first started looking into her, I mean, at first I thought I wasn't going to write about her, but I was also completely, you know, carried away by her story and her character. So, yeah, I mean, she is a very powerful figure, and I think that is a very um, appealing characteristic. Yeah, I've, I found her fascinating. She's both powerful and fragile at exactly the same time in a man's world where actually she mm. outshines so many other agents and it's just incredible She's so very human. let's very human at the same time and sometimes with the heroic figures they've been so mythologized that mm. they've become kind of superhuman and you can no longer relate to them but she's mm. she's she's quite an extraordinary character but Poland needs to speak a lot more about her but I'm I getting ahead so of myself um, so let's fast forward to the outbreak of the war where is uh, Christina Skarbek uh, okay at that so point? Um, in September 1939 Christina is already married to her second husband who is a, an extraordinary character as well, Jerzy Kaczynski, and he is a diplomat and they're on their way to his diplomatic posting in southern Africa. But they hear the news and so they, they wait for orders, nothing is heard, so they turn around and uh, drive back to South Africa to get back to Europe as quickly as possible by ship. But it's immediately wartime conditions, they have to go quite slowly. And in fact, her husband, Jerzy, kept a, 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 a sort of, he wrote his memoirs, they've not been published, but I was lucky enough to get this ream of type paper to pour through. And uh, he told this story that on the ship on the way back, the captain had a kind of notice board, he would communicate to the passengers, and one day the captain wrote, lost a pair of ladies' panties. Okay, underneath he wrote, lost Warsaw. And that was how these patriotic Poles found out about the occupation of their capital city. Mm. And Yezzy wrote, perhaps this is a typical example of the dry British sense of humour, but it was an appalling way to receive that news. I mean, they have family there. Um, so the ship eventually makes its way, you know, they have to go a, a long way around um, back to Southampton. And uh, Yezzy went off and rejoined the Polish forces in France at that point. And uh, he said to Christine, you know, go to London, have a few cocktails, it will be over in a few months. Mm. Um, but she wasn't going to hang around. And within two days of docking, she's made her way to the supposedly secret, actually, head offices of the British Secret Services. And uh, is not so much volunteering as demanding to be <laughs> taken on. And the first memo, because she served directly for the British, because they're the first people that could take her on. Um, she, the, the, some of the memos are in, you know, the British archives. And the first memo says that she's... Um, a flaming Polish patriot, an expert skier and a great adventuress, as well as being absolutely fearless. And one of the men in there, and they would have all been men, of course, there were no mi women doing this role, put in the corner in, in the margin, he wrote, she absolutely terrifies me. <laughs> <laughs> so where is she sent then first? I think she makes her way to Hungary. She goes to Budapest in Hungary and uh, is put in touch with the British Special Forces out there um, and quickly gets in touch with the Polish resistance, which are obviously organising very quickly. The fledgling, not quite the AK then, but... Yeah. Um, and her role is to ski in over the high Tatras uh, into occupied, Nazi German occupied Poland, bringing in money for the fledgling Polish resistance, bringing in radio um, contact points and so on, uh, and propaganda and information. And then she she did four trips like this and she would spend some time going around the country. Observing. Very dangerous. Well, yeah, she's a British agent. She's, well, the Germans would have considered her Jewish. I mean, she's considers herself Roman Catholic, although she actually had to convert to Protestantism to marry her second husband. But she considers herself a Catholic. That's her faith of choice. Um, and it, I mean, she would have been interrogated brutally and shot. And she, of course, she was arrested more than once, but managed to talk her way out and provided all this information on troop movements and so on and smuggled very important microfilm hidden inside her leather gloves back over the border. And, and this is, you know, in winter, she starts, she's in situation um, before Christmas of 1939, very early on, much before any of the other female special agents. And they were partly recruited because Christine showed how effective they could be. Mm. Um, I think there's a, there's a scene somewhere in the book where uh, you describe her going past the frozen corpses of people that have been murdered on the very same route that she's on. This hadn't, these people hadn't actually been murdered. They'd just been trying to get out of ah. occupied Poland and they'd literally frozen to death in the mountains because the conditions that first winter were minus 40. 
I mean, so that is enough. If you get caught in a blizzard, you're not going to survive. Yeah. Um, but this was her first experience. And of course, she's going the other way. They were trying to get out and she's skiing into further danger. So. So she's based in Budapest, where she's treated with some suspicion by, ironically, the Poles that are there, because she's serving for, well, not Poland, even though mm. an, a more ardent Polish patriot would be hard fight. It quickly gets very complicated. Well, I mean, just her service record. So she she's serving directly for the British. She's employed by what's called Section D. The D was for destruction. It was basically early sabotage. This was before the British Special Operations Executive was set up. So she's been recruited by them, uh, also by their propaganda team in Electra House. Um, but then she's also, she also signs up with two different resistance groups inside Poland, and this is fascinating. Um, so one is the ZWZ, which is sort of the main resistance group, which later kind of develops towards being the AKA. Mm. Um, but also the Musketeers, which are much more controversial, consider that. But of course, I mean, there are some people that serve the Musketeers that are now considered great Polish heroes, like Kazimierz Leski, who knew Christina, met her, and they served together um, very briefly, but they met during their service. Um, but Christina, I think this is part of the reason we don't know so much about her, because she is partly blacklisted because she served for the Musketeers, but she actually was also on the list of the ZWZ. So. There's so many stories just for this period of her life that the only thing you can actually do as wise right now is to click on whatever Amazon link or what <laughs> other providers obviously exist to buy this book, because I'm going to have to move Claire on with a huge yeah, amount of... The whole of the, the um, Hungary, Poland, Occupy Poland, this bit is really just the preamble. To, it's her work later in France that makes her legendary. Quite, but she's already established her reputation in more ways than she's one. Let's, let's maybe just pause briefly, Claire, and just acknowledge the fact that um, Christine Granville, as she became known, was really quite an attractive woman. And you, you mentioned it many times. It's, it's not the, the most important thing about her. No, indeed. And, and yet it's a theme that runs through the book. Uh, the, d d it seems that she had this, many people commented on it. It's re referred to repeatedly, this, this ability somehow to, this quixo quixotic beauty, uh, that she could also be both She could invisible turn it off. She could, and she could exactly. make herself disappear. She's That's very fascinating. good. She's very um, able to, she had a brilliant imagination. I mean, Christina, she was one of the most highly trained female special agents. So she was trained to parachute drunk. She was trained to, um, um, in guns and explosives, she was the course that she excelled in was silent killing. So that's killing just with a rope, a knife, or your bare hands. And she always said that her knife was her favourite weapon. Mm. But actually, her best weapon was something different. It's her mind. What mm. she's able to do is she has this incredible, very quick thinking, huge sang froid, keeps her cool, and comes up with creative solutions. So what she does so brilliantly is she talks her way into situations that most of us would be running a mile from, and she talks her way out again with the information, with the men whose lives she saved, whatever it is, she gets her mission accomplished. Yeah, it, it occurs to me there's one situation where she's on the train, I think she's got some documents, she's in Poland, and they're You're searching. determined to talk about flirting, aren't you? I no, mean, not at all. This is just one part of what she did. <laughs> not at all, it's just that it's fascinating to see someone who can be both things at once, you know, both anonymous and not the life and soul of the party, but also the entire center of the room. I just find that such a fascinating quality. I don't think I've ever met anyone that I would describe like Christina as just this extraordinary character. Uh, and she's, um, uh, I'm doing a bad version of the story, but she, she sees that they're searching everybody very carefully. Okay, and so she this, has a bag this of episode, she's sitting on the train and she is taking a package of information to the resistance, which is wrapped in brown paper and string or something. And she suddenly realises that they're doing very systematic checks, carriage to carriage, and they're not just going through looking at travel papers, documents, um, they're going through people's bags and pockets. So she thinks, okay, what am I going to do? What are my options? She thinks I could throw this package out of the train, but then of course she can't deliver it and somebody, the wrong person might pick it up. And she thinks, well, maybe I could jump from the train with it and then I've still got it. But of course then she's risking her life. It's not the best solution. So she's, as she's pondering this, the door to her carriage opens and a German general got in and settled down in front of her. And uh, you know, I would have been jelly. Uh, just jelly, But yeah. she, um, she just thinks, oh, well, that's another option, isn't it? And she does that little, I can't do it, don't worry, I can't do it. <laughs> she does that little flirty thing, and five minutes later they're chatting away, and she says, oh, I'm, so, so, I'm such a silly girl, you know, I've got this packet of black market tea, and they're bound to take it from me, you wouldn't look after it, would you? And he's very gallant, and he says, of course, my dear, and he puts it in his attache case or whatever he's carrying, Unbelievable. And, uh, and goes through all the checks. So 
she was prepared to use any tool, of course, because she's very sensible. So yes, she would use that uh, at times. But being attractive could also be a real problem for her mm. because if you're more attractive, you're more likely to be spotted on a train station. You're more, your face is more recognisable and more remem you know, can be remembered more. So she also learned very much to, to make herself plain, to be able to disappear into a crowd, and that was just as important. Mm. And I think often people say to me, it's the women's beauty that makes them so important. You know, they were honey trapped or they used their flirting ways or whatever. But no, that's not what the women had. And in fact, the female special agents were incredibly diverse. They were all ages. There were grandmothers. There was one lady that only had one leg. You know, it was all sorts. They're really diverse. But I think what they shared, well, they shared great courage and patriotism, sense of duty, these things. But they also shared the female superpower of the 1940s, which isn't to be flirting, it's to be overlooked. Mm. Men overlooked them and they underestimated women, still the case to a degree. And this meant that women, you know, there are. An, there's another story where she's up in the mountains and she's with a man and they get stopped and they check all through the man and stuff. And in her knapsack under a couple of sandwiches are some hand grenades, but they don't bother checking the woman. It was still that degree, so that was a, a something that And she's cool as a bought. cucumber, as you describe in the book, she's cool as a cucumber just sitting there with the grenades in the bag, you know, yeah. they're being searched over there, seconds away from total disaster. She had a qu quite incredible presence of mind and it shows itself again mm. and again and again. Uh, okay, we're going to have to move on. It, it breaks my heart to do this, uh, like I said, at a brief canter. Uh, so she, she, um, uh, she eventually makes her way from Hungary back to London and then is posted to Cairo. Nope. Am I right with the chronology there? Uh, no, she doesn't go back to London at that point. But yes, so she, um, she does send back this incredibly important microfilm to London, which was taken by the Musketeers, which lands on Churchill's desk. And it, what it shows is the massing of troops and tanks on the German side of the German-Soviet border. So this is the first film evidence of Operation Barbarossa. Mm. And this is why Churchill told his, so his daughter, Sarah Oliver, that this agent is my favourite spy. And he was, so at one point at least. You can know, see them getting on quite well, can't you? I think well, it's such a, yeah, such a shame that that film wasn't made because Sarah Oliver was an actress and she was going to play Christine in the title role. But of course, it wasn't made for various reasons. But um, we try and correct that these days, I hope. Anyhow, so um, she sent this microfilm back, but she herself, now with Andrei Kaversky, her, her one-legged comrade in arms, um, make their way on in his Opal Olympia, which he stole in an internment camp from a Gestapo <laughs> officer, but that's another story. <laughs> and they make their way uh, through Europe. And they're, they're, this is the spring of 1941, and the countries they're driving through are falling to the Axis sometimes within weeks and once just within two days. And eventually they arrive at the safety of the British base in Cairo. Yeah. When she's completely put on ice because the British think she must be a German agent. You know, seems one of the few reasons why she's still alive. So. The, the frustration of having to wait there for the operations and this is like a hi hiatus, I suppose, a mm. hiatus, what's the right way of putting it? So yeah, hiatus. Hiatus, yeah. I think I said that right. Uh, where before, as you say, she goes into Back France into and that's when, boy oh boy, does she do some incredible stuff. She's, she's just phenomenal. And actually, she's not there for that long, but it, you know, mm. I had to make it three chapters because her achievements <laughs> are extraordinary. So, yes. Let's go through those three big stories from that time. There's okay. many w w little ones in, in there. Yeah. She's, she's so frustrated that she can't go into action. This is someone who comes alive when she's in the middle of danger. And that's another curious thing about her. I mean, I, I would just be so scared, you know, run away from that kind of thing. She really wanted to go into action and fought like tooth yep. and nail to, uh, to go into service. Why France? Why not Poland? Well, she did want to go back to Poland. She fought very hard to go back to Poland. But at this point, it was, we're talking about the summer of 44. So D-Day is coming up. And then in June, she is, uh, D-Day happens in the, in the north. But she has been trained up and prepared to support what's happening in the French resistance in the south of France. This is the crucial part geographically. And she speaks fluent French, mm. one of her several languages. Um, and so she's sent in to support preparations for the Allied invasion in the south, so D-Day in the south, which is mainly the American forces coming in. Um, so she's sent in to be the courier for Francis Kmerz, who's the leader of the SOE in that area, pulling together the resistance because they provide the radio links so they can do coordinated action. And an incredible character. And basically everyone in this story, in their own way, is an incredible character. He is an incredible character, yeah. He's, uh, um, Let's yeah. let's let's then get on. So uh, chronologically speaking, uh, it's the oh, I'm going to mangle the print. Maybe you should tell the story, <laughs> Claire. Is it? Is this parachuted uh, in in July '44 behind enemy lines? 
Where, where do you want to then, go? Then, then goes on to, uh, you know, there's the, the, the Vorkor Ridge, is it? The, the horrible Verkor. battle, Verkor. It's the just, battle of Verkor. I had no idea about this story. Uh, yes, it's, it's not now, something um, that's known Paddy in the Ashdown UK. has now written a whole book just on, oh, on really? Verkor. Yeah, I helped him with the Christine bit. Obviously. This is an extraordinary story. Yeah, so it was this um, premature, really, stand of the French resistance and um, it's, it's on this plateau, it's uh, shaped by like an arrow really, and it's quite highly raised. And so it's quite an important defensive position. So the French Maquis, um, who are sort of like the partisan forces, were based there. And she is in, in the middle of the Battle of Vercors. Um, but her, her role is much more than that. So she's doing some radio work there. She's doing courier work with the resistance up in the mountain. Um, it, incredibly sad stories uh, from there. But I went out and did some research and managed to meet a couple of the veterans who remembered her. They'd been teenagers. I went to the, they have an annual remembrance ceremony wow. for this incredibly important patriotic battle that took place, very symbolic battle in France. Um, and they were teenagers. One of them remembered her having an aperitif in a cafe before chucking her leg over the back of a motorbike and going into the battle. I mean, this is amazing. Incredible. So, um, but anyhow, so that, but then she goes off and she's kind of got some missions of her own. Yes, yeah, so they have to kind of get through the, they have to escape basically the battle as the, as the escape route that they've at got the is end, closed off. At the off. end they pull out and they get Such out. Such a tragic story. It's really it, heartbreaking when that it, happens. Let's talk about some of these individual missions then. Uh, will we get on to her basically single-handedly, yeah, okay, so uh, unbelievably just single-handedly walking up to a base and getting everybody to surrender. It's just phenomenal. So yeah, I mean, she went up into the mountains and she made the first contact with the French uh, resistance to the Italian partisans, which was very important, took back their requests for ammunition, food, packed meat, all the things that that needed. Um, but then while she's up in the mountains, she discovers that there's a very strategic garrison held by the Germans on a strategic pass called the Col de l'Arche. And this is one of the routes that needs to be controlled and in fact opened up um, for the American forces are coming in and so on. And so she, what she learns is that a number of the, um, uh, not the senior people at the garrison, but the soldiers are ethnically Poles and they've been conscripted under duress or from western part of Poland and you know God knows what circumstances. And so she goes up and normally in the mountains she's trying to pretty much hide, turn up as a peasant woman, you know. But this time, I mean, it, really risky. She goes up with white and red uh, ribbons in her hair, a scarf in her hair. So she's clearly saying I'm Polish and very obvious to see. They could have trained a gun on her for, you know, a long... But up she goes and she talks to them passionately in, the, in Polish. And she, she gets them to agree that at a certain date and time, a week later, roughly a week later, they agreed they would take the breech blocks out of the big guns and uh, take any of the smaller arms that they could carry, grenades and guns and so on, down the mountain and surrender. And they did it exactly as they had agreed with Christina. So the men come, uh, you know, the next week at the right time, the men come to take the surrender and officially the men take the surrender of the garrison. But she's single-handedly done it on her own a week earlier. Single-handedly. It's quite a story. Uh, okay, it's a then, great story. Th then I think my favourite <coughs> one of all is when she single-handedly rescues her colleagues from you know, certain death. I don't death. think we should do all the stories. She does. She comes down the mountain. She discovers that Francis Kermertz and uh, a French officer and another British officer have been arrested by the Gestapo. They're in a jail. She, she begs the French resistance to save them, but they, they, they say no, they can't risk. You know, with, they've had parachuted down with her help, in fact, lots of ammunition and instructions of which roads to keep open, where to fell trees to yeah. stop different routes and so on. And they can't risk their men and their arms just before the Americans are coming. So they say no. So she gets on a bicycle, off she goes, identifies the prison and sorts it all out and saves all three men just before they're going to be shot. By, uh, to make it more specific, he's going in, she's going to the German Gestapo, is it, he's Gestapo, not SS. Uh, officer. Officer. Yeah, he he's trains got a pistol his in his hand, her. you know, he's got the pistol and he's banging on the table and, and she basically does something quite amazing, which is say, listen, Pretty, they're going to be turning up pretty soon. You're in big trouble. If you shoot these guys, you're going to be executed by the local populace. There's yeah. nowhere you can escape to. And it puts the fear of God into him. She absolutely terrified him. So in her own account, by the end of it, his hand is shaking. He's giving her <laughs> coffee and it's going into the saucer because he is so worried. He knows that the Americans are about to come. But she's just brought the date forward a few days. Um, and she says, you know, I will speak for you if you help me now. Yeah. And so he goes with her. Um, and then you describe it so well in the book, the, the, the chat it was Francis and Zan, is that the way you say it? Yeah, yeah. Zan Fielding. They're, they're being led out and essentially because they're in the hands of the Gestapo, they know exactly what's going to come. Which yeah, is they're being led to towards the football pitch, which is where the executions take place. We are going to die. And they, they're being led out and then all of a sudden they get into a car, 
a bit confusing, and then they drive off, and then all of a sudden, Christine's there. It's only when Francis saw Christine waiting in the, in the beside a farm building just outside that he turns to see her, and he suddenly realises, oh my God, this is a rescue operation. And she These just three jumps guys, into the car. Uh, she gets into the car and off they go. It, I mean, it, yeah. There's many more details. It's great. It's There's great. So many, and that's why I'm just <laughs> going to have to. I'm going to have to plug this book to, to avoid Claire's <laughs> bushes. But it, oh. really, we are not doing many of the stories even half the justice they do because that particular story reads like an absolute thriller. You know, they're seconds away from death. It's just, I mean, the the level of risk taking and bravery is quite phenomenal. Well, the sad fact is that. Christine Granville, as she became, as she became uh, British, had a, quite a fight to become British and uh, f quite frankly, disgracefully treated by the authorities as the war came to an end. Mm -hmm. um, can you just talk to us about that? Because I think it's quite important to recognise yes. this. I was very angry and upset because I, I um, am getting these papers out. So she ended the war. She was back in Cairo at the end of the war, having done various other missions. and. Um, She's dismissed and the last, uh, I mean, she was dismissed, she was given three months salary, so it wasn't nothing, it was about £100, but in those days that was quite a significant amount. But she knew she couldn't go back to Occupy Poland, not safely. Um, for example, her, her brother, who had, I don't know that much of what he did, but he served in the resistance inside Poland and he died in the first year in a jail, you know, um, of tuberculosis caught in a, a Soviet-backed jail. So um, she knew she couldn't go back. And actually, the British should have known that she couldn't go back because mm. I found papers that showed that they had traded her and Andrei Kowarski's, the one-legged man's, um, details for the names of two NKVD spies. So the Russians knew exactly who she was. And if she'd have gone back, she'd have been picked up immediately. So she's left high and dry in, in Cairo. And the, one of the last bits of paper, and I'm quoting from it, but it says in there, um, she is no longer wanted. Yeah. This is a woman who put her life on the line for six years for the British Crown directly. You know, she was the first female special agent by some time, and she was the longest serving special agent for the British, male or female, during the war. And by far the highest trained, I guess. With one of the highest trained through. and one of the most highly decorated. Well, so, I mean, then the British said, but we do want to give you these decorations. So, she, I mean, she got the OBE George Medal, significant honours. Um, but she said that I refuse to accept honours from a country that after this won't give me nationality, citizenship. Uh, and and, and basically she, shamed them into giving it to her. And even when she did get it, it wasn't citizen it, or, or other second subject. Class. It was a second, second class. class. But, I mean, because she then fought that battle, that, that distinction was taken away. But I mean, these are, you know, she was a fighter, but she shouldn't have had to keep fighting battles like that at the end of the war. But I have to say that neither, even to this day, she she doesn't have a Polish honour or recognition. Um, I think that both countries didn't acquit themselves. I mean, Christine is one of those people. She's she just is on the margin of everything. She's too Polish to be really British. She's too Jewish to be really Christian. She's she's too male to be really female, but too female to be male. You know, she's just so herself. She is dynamically who she is, her own personality, and. The world wasn't ready for her in the 1940s, 50s. Mm, ain't that the truth? Mm. Uh, we're both British. Yes. Let's be honest. Britain comes out of this very shamefully at the end of that book uh, that you wrote, the, and the way she was treated. I think it's important to yeah. I think it's important to pin down the truth as far as we can. She was treated appallingly. It was partly sexism. I think there was some anti-Semitism as well in there. I mean, certainly after the Hotel David bomb, they weren't employing anyone that they thought they might have conflicted loyalties in any way. So that played a factor. Obviously, at the end of the war, there are a number of Poles in Britain and a lot of their qualifications weren't accepted. And so she ends up being a bathroom stewardess on, on the ships. You know, before the war, when she first came to London to volunteer, she was a countess on that ship in first class. She ends up cleaning bathrooms yep. on the not, ships. Not the, mean, uh, not the only high-ranking Polish person who ends Absolutely. up doing a, a menial job. Yeah. And, and, and therefore, we've come to the part of the story where just so tragically, after all the risk and danger she'd taken, she's murdered in essentially this, this sort of squalid manner by this... Uh, unpleasant fellow who's not, I don't want to spend too much time talking about him, but she's essentially murdered by this by this man who becomes infatuated with her on one of the ships in which she's serving. Can we talk about that just briefly? I feel like, I feel like some people may want to find this out when they read the book. I, I do think it's a really important story. I don't think it's something that we should dwell on too much. I mean, yes, Christine was murdered at the end of her life. It's absolutely appalling. 
Um, and because she didn't have descendants, I was able to apply under the Freedom of Information Act to get out the court papers, the hospital papers, the police records. Um, and, and in fact, one of the things that I received was a little manila envelope and out slipped onto the floor all the um, crime scene photographs, which were really upsetting. Uh, uh, and I, I read that and thought, Oh my God, mm. that must have, after everything you'd done at that stage. It was, it was very painful. You know, these photographs are, not, uh, quite a lot of the photographs, Christine's not in focus because she's a woman of action. She's always moving. This one, she's perfectly in focus, but you can tell she's not there. This is just a body. She's gone. Um, but really distressing. So, yes, I mean, I, I, we do know exactly what happened and all of the details are in the book, but let's focus on her at the height of her achievements yep. when she's doing so much for the Allied war effort. Uh, you have, uh, I think, been the one person who's brought her story to life more than anyone else, although there were a few attempts at books and the film that you've mentioned. They're happy. Um, I certainly know many Polish people who've recommended me uh, this oh, book good. as well. I'm so on behalf of the whole it. of Poland, if you haven't been aware oh, no. of any gongs and bongs, <laughs> then you absolutely should do. Oh, I do um, have a How did your bong. relationship to her change over time? Did you, were there points where you felt like you really understood her? You're, you're also a, a woman and a mom and uh, you've got three kids. I still find it amazing how any Mum can write a book at the same time as being. It's just just incredible. Um, did you did you did Dad's you really write books all the time? You know they do. They do. Mm. True. Same. Um, uh, did did you um, did you feel like your relationship with her had changed over time as you got to know her better? Yeah, I mean, I did get to know her in one sense, but I didn't get to know her. I never met her as an individual, as a person, and I think it's. You, you go through this process as a biographer. You know, you find your subject. You don't always fall in love with them. If you're writing about Hitler, let's say you don't, but. Yes, I fell completely in love with her. But then you you begin to objectify. You say, oh, God, why did she do it like that? Like you begin to be critical. And I think that process of removing yourself from them is really important if you're going to write a serious book. You can't just write a hagiography. So for me, it was really important to, to present her warts and all. You know, There are times when she's frustrated and she can't go on. She sits down under a tree and she cries. And there are moments like this because she's a real person. And I think, I mean, you started off saying this. We want to read books about people that have done something amazingly out of our experience, an astronaut, a you know, Nobel Prize winner, someone that we can learn from, but also someone that we can identify with. She is really human yeah. and she brings this story to life and makes it so compelling because she is such you know, a fantastic, ordinary woman doing extraordinary things. Boy, isn't that the case, which is why it's duty bound for me to say again that really this <laughs> is the book that you've got to read if you want to know about one of Britain's greatest ever spies and probably someone who just really does need to get deserved more, far more notice in Poland. Uh, Claire, uh, I heard a rumour that certain famous Hollywood people were very interested in this story. That was a while ago though. Oh, yeah. So, uh, is there an update on that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean the book has been optioned for film for some time. It, it was with a very large studio for some time. That option ran it out, I'm afraid to say. So those stories are in the past, but it was re-optioned very recently by another Hollywood film production company. So I mean, as far as I understand it, they option a lot of books and they make a small percentage of them, but no book is gonna be made into film without an option. It's, it's there, um, they seem very keen at the moment, so they're looking at script writers at the moment. So fingers crossed everyone, Fingers please. crossed on behalf yeah. of uh, this amazing woman yeah, and Yeah, she and really deserves story. it. Doesn't she just, you know? It's utterly stunning, it's 2021 and yeah. Mm. As, and that's, because new James Bond film came out and everyone's like, why don't we have a female James Bond? Or, we, you know, I think, you know, we don't need one. We've got a real woman, not a figment of some male fantasy figure. We've got a real woman who achieved all this stuff. Let's recognise that. And ironically, as I think you mentioned, uh, Ian Fleming may have heard of her and based his character Vesperlin. Yes, uh, I think uh, I don't think they ever met. Um, but when he was promoting his first Bond book, which was Casino Royale, which was just after about a year after she died, um, he was promoting it in America and giving lots of interviews, doing a PR tour, and I. I managed to find some interviews, let's call them gentlemen's magazines. And, uh, and they'd asked him about who was, you know, did he base James Bond on anyone in real life? And he mentioned a few people. And then without being asked anything more, and he said there was an amazing woman, one amazing woman. Her name was Christine Granville. And so it is clear that she was on his radar and that he was, to some extent, inspired by her as well. Wow, yeah. in that but, sense. But I think she's much more than, you know, an inspiration for Ian Fleming. And, that, and a bit that's part the least, character. Yeah, yeah, she's not a Bond girl. She's yeah. Bond, but she's a real, a real one. Yeah, this book is absolutely jam 
packed with amazing instances like that. The the level of detail, but also the ease of reading is really quite uh, amazing. And as I said to you before the interview, for me, it just reminded me uh, of Ben McIntyre in terms of his ability to, to spin a great story whilst also having the right level of detail. So I just want to say hats off to you for, uh, for writing such a fantastic book. It's not Thank your you only much. book, though. You've got other books no. that you've written, other yes. books that you're writing. I've written We've three. I'm here, here in Poland researching my next book, another incredible Polish woman. And Claire, I think you've come to Poland to, uh, to research a new book about a very fascinating figure. Can you talk about that? I am so lucky. I've had two weeks in Poland. Uh, people have been incredibly generous with me, veterans, family members, archives, and I'm researching the story of uh, General Elżbieta Zawadzka, so second Polish woman to become a general and the only female Chico Chemny or silent unseen parachuted from Britain behind enemy lines back into Nazi-occupied Poland incredible woman, really inspirational. When can we expect that amazing book to come out? Well, I'm just starting my research. I've only been going for a couple of months. I have a huge amount of information. <laughs> um, I need to process that. It's probably going to be at least two years, maybe three years. OK, well, we look forward to that moment. Thank you, Claire. So. We've already made a date to see each other on Heart of Poland 375,000, or whichever episode <laughs> we're on by then. Claire Mali, thank you so much for joining us. It's I've, a pleasure. I've been looking forward to speaking to you for really since this programme has begun. I've wanted mm. to do this interview with you, so I'm so grateful that we've had the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, and sadly, we've just done a little bauble of a taste, and now people are just going to have to buy the damn book. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm so grateful uh, to Claire for making time to come and see us. As you probably know, if you're a long-term fan of the Heart of Poland programme, we have spoken to just about every single cracking author on the subject of Poland. And it's inspiring, tragic, but ultimately, I think, uh, a fascinating story. Uh, we've looked at Poland in the past, we've looked at Poland in the present, and we've certainly looked at Poland in the future, whether it's quantum scientists, uh, basketball players, beekeepers, authors and historians like Claire, we really have tried to go on this impossible mission to find the heart of Poland. Christina's story really inspired me, and it's a beautiful story. It's a tragic story, but it's also a story of just an incredible person doing incredible things, but uniquely human. So I really highly recommend that you go out and find out more uh, about her story and read that book. But if you want to learn more about the fascinating country of Poland, you know what you need to do, which is check another episode of Heart of Poland. You can find Heart of Poland on thefirstnews.com, which is the premier English language uh, news service for Poland. You can find us on all the uh, social media platforms, except TikTok. We don't go there. So I'll see you again for another episode of Heart of Poland. <laughs>